Hi, this is Public Health 100, Human Nutrition, Wellness, and Safety. This is Lecture A, Basic Nutrition. My name is Professor Allison Liu, and I am a registered nurse. I have a bachelor's degree and master's degree in nursing, and I'm currently working on a doctorate of nursing practice. I have an accreditation in case management, and I'm a certified executive in nurse practice. And if you would like to learn more about my career, please visit my LinkedIn profile. It's linked here. So let's go ahead and get into the material. Basic nutrition. I want to encourage you to please, please look at your syllabus because that's your guide for this course and it will really answer a lot of your questions and help you know what your assignments are. I do want to point out that there's an online and an in-person uh, version of this particular class. If you are an in-person student, the dates on the table in the syllabus are the goal dates to have those completed for the week, except for the last assignment of the week. The last assignment of the week has the firm deadline for completion of all work for that week. The reason the other dates are there is so it gives you a guide to make sure that you have done all the course material before your in-person session, before that session occurs. So that you will have, you know, done all the assignments ahead of that, you've done all the uh, listening to the lecture or reading associated with it. That is why that first date is there. I will not count anything late until Sunday night at 11.30 p.m. But Sunday night at 11.30 p.m., anything after that is late and that would have a consequence. Um, for online students, you do not have an in-person session. So there really isn't a reason that you absolutely need to complete assignments by the due dates on that table, except again, for the Sunday at the end of the week, for week one, the Sunday, the 12th, etc. You want to make sure that you've done all the work for the week by Sunday at 11.30 p.m., okay? Um, so, without further ado, we're gonna get into basic nutrition. Learning objectives for this lecture. We're gonna learn about the course, that's what we've done so far, and we're gonna describe basic concepts in nutrition, we're gonna describe factors that affect your nutritional needs and every person's nutritional needs. And we're gonna describe the importance of research and scientific methods applied to the understanding of nutrition specifically. So let's start with the question, what are nutrients? So nutrients are substances required by the body to perform its basic functions. There are six classes of nutrients required by the body. They are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, water, vitamins, and minerals. Now I'm gonna follow this link to the textbook so that we can look at that for a moment. This is your textbook. It's online open source and there's really no reason not to consult it and use it and read it because it's available to you at all times, okay? Anytime you have the internet. Um, so here's a section of your textbook. You can see it has illustrations, tables, all kinds of things that any textbook would have. And then it has these learning uh, exercises that are online. And you can do those to help reinforce your learning. And I would encourage you to do that. We'll do a few of them in the process of doing the course. Okay, so there's your textbook. And it will be linked sometimes in assignments or linked in uh, your slides. I would encourage you to follow those links when you see them. Uh, why do we need to eat? This is an important question when you're studying nutrition. In a word, we need to eat to survive. We need to survive and we need to obtain energy in order to do that. And we measure energy in calories. And to obtain the nutrients we need, we have to eat. There are certain nutrients that our body cannot make out of other materials that it has and we must take those in. Those are called essential nutrients. So these are the reasons, the most important reasons that we need to eat. There are micronutrients and there are macronutrients. So that's two categories of nutrients I want you to remember. The macronutrients are nutrients that we need in large quantities and those are carbohydrates, lipids, 
protein, and water. And then the micronutrients are the ones we need in lesser quantities, and those are vitamins and minerals. And so I've underlined micro and macro because if you remember macro means big, it'll be easier to remember what the macronutrients are because they're the ones we need a lot of. Micronutrients are the ones we need a little of. Micro means small. So macronutrients are shown here. You can see proteins. You got your meats there, carbohydrates, bread, lipids, oil, and water. You have a glass of water shown. So here's examples of micronutrients. We need them the small, smaller quantities, and we have a whole list of them here that are minerals, and then we have another list of vitamins, and we'll discuss those in more detail as we go along, but there's a list to show you examples. So what drives food choices? This is an important question in nutrition. Most students, when asked what causes people to eat what they do, they say taste, and that is a big factor. Taste, texture, and the look of food are important factors. Then there's economics, what people can afford to eat. There's early food experiences. There's the habits that they've formed, and those are hard to change sometimes. There's culture, the culture they were raised in, the culture they live in now. Those may be the same, those may be different. Geography, and that can also change, but geography influences what we eat, where we live, what we have access to. Advertising can influence what we eat, social factors, health concerns. If someone has a health concern, maybe they don't want to get heart disease and their father got heart disease, they may adjust their eating habits to try to prevent that problem. If they have high blood pressure, they may adjust their eating habits to control that problem. Emotions, so some people eat in response to certain emotions or don't eat as much in response to different emotions or they eat different things. Then sustainability. So let's test your understanding a little bit by using one of the exercises in the book. So we're going to go down to the bottom and we're going to drag and drop the factor that matches each description. The first description is taste, texture, and appearance can influence food choices depending on what that person's preference is, that one's food preferences. Then we have income can influence what a person eats, that one's economics. If a person has a health condition that requires them to follow a certain diet, then that can affect what a person eats. That is health concerns. And if we go down just a little bit, we can see the rest of them. The influence of peers on our food choices, that one is social factors. Then this one talks about a person's diet staples can be influenced by where they live. That one is geography. And the very last one is cultural traditions can affect the person's view on food and diet. So that one's culture. And so we're going to go down to the bottom and press check. And we can see we got all of those correct. All right, so let's talk about some key concepts of nutrition, and then we're going to go on to them in a little more detail. The first one is achieving a healthy diet um, as a matter of balance, okay? So balance the quality and the quantity of the food that is eaten. And balance is something I want you to remember throughout this class because balance is key, an overarching theme in nutrition because balance is what keeps us from making choices that are really, really detrimental to our health. The five key factors are first, the diet must be adequate, providing essential nutrients as well as fiber and adequate calories. So adequacy is first. Second, that balanced diet that we just talked about and that results when you do not consume one nutrient at the expense of another, but rather get appropriate amounts of all nutrients. Next, we have calorie control, and that is necessary so that the amount of energy we get from our nutrients that we're taking in uh, equals the amount of energy that we're spending during our day in our activities or what we need to live. Fourth, moderation means not eating to extremes, neither too much nor too little. Whether you're eating too little or too much, you're going to have health problems. You need what's in the middle, eating the right amount. Variety refers to, that's the fifth one, and it refers to consuming different foods from within the same food groups on a regular basis, okay? 
So you don't want to eat all the same things. They tell children to eat a rainbow. And the reason they tell them that is because um, it encourages them to eat a lot of variety if they eat a lot of different colors of foods. Now, um, some foods have food coloring in them. We're not talking about those. We're talking about naturally occurring color. If you do that, then you'll get more variety. So that's why they encourage children to do that. Color is something children understand and like. So a healthful diet favors whole foods. And many of you may have heard that before. And those are as an alternative to modern processed foods. But why is that? Many commercially prepared and fast foods lack the needed nutrients. Also, many commercially prepared and fast foods have huge amounts of saturated fat, sugar, salt, and trans fats, and most people are getting way too much of those anyway. What do these huge amounts of sugar, saturated fats, trans fats, and salt often lead to? They can lead to diseases that kill and cripple many people, including atherosclerosis, heart disease, stroke, cancer, obesity, diabetes, and then some other diseases as well, or they make them worse. So let's get down to business about the keys uh, to a healthful diet by talking about some detail about several of them. The first one we're going to talk about is adequacy. So in order to get an adequate diet, you want to favor nutrient-dense foods. Nutrient-dense foods contain more essential nutrients per calorie and are the opposite of empty calorie foods. Examples of nutrient-dense foods are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean meats, poultry, fish, low-fat dairy products. These are examples of nutrient-dense foods. Nutrient um, Less dense foods are things like the snack foods in the picture. They don't have a whole lot of nutrient density per amount of food you're eating. So it's not that you cannot include Cheetos and Fritos and Funyuns in your diet, but you wouldn't want to be relying on them as a major food source um, because they are not very healthy foods and also they just don't have the nutrient density. And if that's where you're getting your calories, you're not gonna get the micronutrients and other nutrients that you need. The next one we're gonna talk about in detail is balance. Balance means not consuming one nutrient at the expense of another. So let's talk about an example of that. Calcium is essential to healthy bones and teeth, but too much calcium interferes with iron absorption by the body. So foods high in calcium are usually poor sources of iron. And that is important because if you um, only focus on calcium and you eat high calcium foods for your bones and teeth, um, you may actually harm your absorption of iron um, and if you only focus on iron and making sure you get enough iron and not having the calcium on board that might decrease your iron absorption, you won't get enough calcium. So you basically have to consume the proper amounts of both of these foods in order to get proper nutrition. And that is a good example of balance and how balance can be disrupted if you're not careful. So let's talk about moderation for a moment. Uh, moderation helps us to achieve a healthy diet. And one way that we can have a, a moderation in our lives is to use portion control. So you wouldn't wanna depend on the grocery store or a restaurant to decide the portions of food because they give very distorted portions a lot of times. So when the uh, recommendation for nutrition says you need three servings of vegetables, they're talking about the portion sizes that the nutrition community, the scientific community considers a portion size, a serving size. They're not talking about what the grocery store or the restaurant thinks. So a portion size or serving size of these foods would be as follows. These are ways to remember it. Um, protein, the size of the hand, the palm of the hand. Um, vegetables, the size of a closed fist carbs, the size of the inside of the palm of the hand, and fat, the size of your thumb. And so if you look at those portion sizes, um, they can help you to have moderation in your diet. And let's talk about variety again. Um, eating a variety of foods helps to make sure we are consuming all the essential nutrients in adequate amounts. It just puts the odds in your favor that you're getting what you need. 
All right, so we're going to shift gears for just a minute and talk about the scientific method. And the reason that we're doing that is because we're going to talk about how the scientific method applies to nutrition specifically. So you've probably studied the scientific method at some point if, in your life. If you haven't, be sure and spend some time with your textbook because it does give you a good explanation of the scientific method. Um, but the first step is to ask a question. The second step is to do background research. The third step is to form hypothesis. And the fourth step is to test that hypothesis. The fifth step is to analyze the data. And the sixth step is to determine your conclusion. So there are several types of studies that are done in nutrition. Um, one is an epidemiological study, which is an observational study of populations around the world and the impact of nutrition on health. So an example of that would be if uh, we study diets that are high in saturated fat being associated with increased risk of heart attacks. So we might find that to be true, but an interesting note is that just because we know that to be true from an epidemiological standpoint, we cannot prove cause and effect with an epidemiological study alone. It can't show us that the high saturated fat actually causes heart attacks. Now we have enough data today that shows that a high saturated fat diet does actually cause heart attacks, but we didn't get that information from epidemiological studies alone. The next is an intervention clinical trial. Scientific investigation where a variety, um, a variable is changed between groups. So what that means is, an example, is testing the effect of different diets on blood pressure. One group consumes an American diet. Another group might consume a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, which the typical American diet is not. And then a third group may eat a combination of those two diets. Now, if an intervention clinical trial is done correctly, it can determine cause and effect relationships, but it must be done correctly and designed well. Randomized clinical controls are the gold standard of scientific studies. I want you to remember that, that randomized clinical trials are the gold standard of scientific studies. Participants are assigned in a random clinical trial by chance to separate groups that compare different treatments. Neither the researcher nor the participant can choose which group a participant is assigned to. An example would be testing the effect of calcium supplements on women with osteoporosis. Participants would be, for example, given a pill daily that is a fake pill or a placebo or a calcium supplement. Neither the participant nor the researcher knows what group the participant is in. Nobody knows. And, well, there's a list somewhere, but nobody involved in the study knows. And that's the gold standard of scientific study because it decreases bias and allows the most data can be collected. And it definitely can help us determine cause and effect relationships. Animal and cellular biology studies, and those are studies that are conducted on animals or on cells. Testing the effects of a new blood pressure medicine on guinea pigs or on lipid membranes of cells are examples of this type of study. While these studies are less expensive than human trials, um, the studies that you do with animals and cells do not necessarily extrapolate well to humans. It may not be applicable to humans, and so that's a weakness of this type of study. Human beings are different than guinea pigs. So let's talk about an evidence-based approach to nutrition. And here you have listed how one would have an evidence-based approach. First, there would be observations, forming questions, setting criteria for quality evidence, evaluating the body of knowledge, summarizing the body of knowledge, and specifying the strength of evidence required to make decisions. And once all that was done, it usually takes a long time, you disseminate information. So let's talk for a minute about what that would look like for a particular nutritional related problem. We're gonna take goiter, G-O-I-T-E-R, as an example. Goiter is actually an enlarged thyroid gland, and the thyroid is in the neck, and you can see in this picture that this individual has a goiter. So people didn't know what caused goiters, but they did observe that they were happening in some places 
often and not happening in others. So people started forming questions. Why would these goiters be occurring some places and not others? And they came up with ideas and theories about why that might be. Eventually, scientific work was done to try to figure out what was causing the goiters. And once a lot of scientific evidence had been collected, this process of setting criteria for quality evidence, evaluating the body of knowledge and summarizing that body of knowledge took place. What it turned out to be was that goiters were usually caused by a lack of iodine. And so the information obtained about what causes goiters was then used to mostly solve this public health problem. The government decided to put iodine into table salt, and since people use table salt all the time, that ensured that people got enough iodine. And today, we do not see these iodine deficiency goiters like we used to see. And the goiters could be very dis uh, disfiguring. They could also cause problems with um, pressing on other uh, structures in the neck and causing health problems that way. And so once all that had taken place, um, not only could the individual be treated and uh, they could benefit from the knowledge that iodine deficiency was causing goiters, but the community at large, the public, could benefit through public health campaigns and policies to increase iodine consumption and make sure no one was deficient. All right, so we do want our nutritional information and our nutritional uh, policy making to be evidence-based, and that's a good example of a time that we did that. I will see you in in-person class if you're in person. Um, and if you're not in person, an online student, I will see you in lecture B next. Thanks so much. Make sure to complete your questions for lecture A and your um, in-person assignment if you're in person or your discussion uh, assignment if you are online. Thank you.